Hello, everyone. My name is Yvette Cozier. I'm the Associate Dean for Diversity, Equity, Inclusion, and Justice at Boston University School of Public Health. Thank you for joining us for our latest public health conversation starter. Today's conversation is part of our SPH Reads series. SPH Reads is a school-wide reading program hosted by the Office of Diversity, Equity, Inclusion, and Justice. It aims to encourage critical thought and discussion among all members of the BUSPH community and is centered on a carefully chosen thought-provoking book. The selection for fall 2024, spring 2025 academic year is Strangers in Their Own Land, Anger and Mourning on the American Right by Arlie Russell Hochschild. In conjunction with this year's book selection, I'm having discussions with leaders on themes of political divides, class, and race. Today, I have the privilege of speaking with Dr. Timothy Callahan, who is an Associate Professor of Health Policy and Politics within the Department of Health Law, Policy, and Management at BU School of Public Health. Dr. Callahan received his PhD at the University of Minnesota in Political Science, and before coming to Boston University, he was an Assistant Professor of Health Policy and Politics at the, at the Texas A&M University School of Public Health. Dr. Callahan has won many awards for his research, including the Atlas Award for his research on vaccine he hesitancy and the Leonard S. Robbins Award for his research on public attitudes about the opioid epidemic. Dr. Callahan's research focuses on how politics, policy, and place work together in the role of health in America. Thank you for being with us today, Dr. Callahan. I'm so happy to be here. Thank you for having me. Sure. So um, in your research, what critical pieces of information have mm -hmm. you found in how politics affects the role of health in America? Yeah, it's such a great question. And I think as we start talking about this, the first thing we need to recognize is that politics impacts every aspect of health in America, right? It impacts the politicians that we elect and the policies that they pass while in office, which fundamentally shapes the healthcare that we receive, right? Um, so if you think about health policies that shape our daily lives, programs like Medicare and Medicaid, even the delivery of private health insurance, all of those programs are shaped by the choices of our political leaders and often for political reasons. Um, so as a political scientist in the School of Public Health, I'm really interested in how we sort of get those policies and uh, these political choices. For example, some of my research has examined state decisions about whether to expand Medicaid under the Affordable Care Act and the impact that that's had on the health in many states across the country. I'm also really interested in this question of how individual partisan beliefs can shape individual health attitudes and behaviors. Um, so I've regularly studied the relationship between vaccine hesitancy and partisanship as well as trying to better understand how partisanship impacts other health attitudes and behaviors. Um, some recent work has looked at topics like the 988 mental health lifeline, uh, Medicaid work requirements, even new obesity medications. So a whole variety of topics. Oh, wow. So um, so regarding your research um, on the uh, health attitudes and behaviors on vaccine hesitancy, what have your findings been? Yeah, so vaccine hesitancy is a huge area of research for me. And um, as I've mentioned, a lot of my research focuses on how politics impl impacts vaccine hesitancy. And you know, one of my, my more prominent papers, uh, I, I'm on a research team that was one of the first to demonstrate very early in the COVID-19 pandemic, even before we had a vaccine against COVID, that partisanship was going to be a primary driver of decisions about whether or not to vaccinate. And, and that's exactly what has played out, unfortunately, uh, with Republicans far less likely than Democrats to vaccinate resulting in different mortality rates in counties across the US. Um, more broadly than that, though, I, I'm not just interested in politics. I'm also interested in sort of the other social and psychological origins of vaccine hesitancy, with the ultimate goal of trying to identify strategies to reduce that vaccine hesitancy. Um, one of the key findings from a lot of my research, uh, and, and a lot of this research I've done alongside Dr. Matt Mata, who's also a professor at the BU School of Public Health, is demonstrating that by understanding these political and psychological drivers of both decisions not to vaccinate, we can work to develop more tailored interventions or tailored messages to encourage hesitant people to vaccinate. Um, because one of the things we've found is that a one size fits all approach just simply does not work. What's going to convince you to vaccinate might be very different from what convinces me to vaccinate. 
And by better understanding people's partisan and psychological predispositions, we can help get them the message that's going to give them the best public health message possible. Um, besides that, I, I have a lot of ongoing projects focused on vaccine hesitancy right now. Uh, one of my big areas of focus right now is actually maternal vaccination. Uh, maternal vaccination in this country uh, for pregnant individuals is far below desired levels. And we have two brand new immunizations tied to RSV. Um, there's a brand new vaccine for pregnant individuals who are 32 through 36 weeks pregnant. And we also have a brand new immunization for infants. And um, those were available for the first time last year and the immunization rates were troublingly low. So I'm working with other scholars at the BU School of Public Health to try and find ways to work with obstetric care providers to increase vaccination rates. Um, and then the other major thing I'm working on right now is recognizing that the government put out a whole lot of messages during the COVID-19 pandemic trying to convince people to vaccinate. And we don't really know which ones worked and which ones it didn't. Um, and for better or worse, we have to recognize that there's going to be future public health emergencies and understanding what kinds of government messages do and don't work uh, is an important step forward. So I'm working with a research team right now on an NSF funded project to try and find those best communication approaches for governmental entities. Okay, great. Um, and so just sort of thinking about uh, trying to learn from COVID and our current situation, um, there's kind of this new uh, arising um, phenomena, which is like FEMA hesitancy. Right, so um, not uh, uh, the Federal um, Emergency Management um, Administration uh, in the wake of Hurricanes Helene and Milton. Um, do you see this playing out similarly to vaccine hesitancy? Yeah, it's a really great question. And I think while my primary interest is in vaccine hesitancy, a lot of the lessons we learn there are, are relevant to other areas of policymaking. Um, and, and FEMA is certainly um, drawing a lot of attention right now in the wake of the two hurricanes you just mentioned. And I think we have to recognize that a lot of what we're experiencing uh, among individuals in these communities and their distrust of FEMA relates to a broader distrust of government entities. It relates to a broader distrust of science and a growth of what um, some scholars have called sort of anti-intellectualism, trusting the wisdom of ordinary citizens over experts. And when we think about trying to confront that, that's a daunting task, especially when it's paired with the massive amounts of mis and disinformation that spread so rapidly on social media. So I think there's a lot of parallels we can look to between vaccine hesitancy and, and other areas of governmental action or, or even policymaking more broadly. So, so a question that I have, um, just in, uh, following up on what you just said, and, and, and it's not always clear to me, and I don't know if it's clear to others, but what is the, the benefit of distrusting government or what is the benefit in even those in government on sort of fostering distrust among um, the population? Um, yeah, I think it's a really interesting question. I think there's a couple things we have to keep in mind. One is um, not all government action throughout history has been good. Um, there's a lot of minority voices in, in different communities who have not been cared for in the way that they should. You know, there's sort of classic examples we might point to in the field of public health. Uh, the Tuskegee syphilis studies come to mind immediately as an example where governmental actors were up to no good and doing things to actively harm citizens. More broadly, we want to make sure that minority voices of all kinds are heard in our society. And we need to ensure through elections and other means that our elected representatives are following the will of the people and also ensuring that a, a variety of voices are heard in our political process. So I think some degree of skepticism is perhaps a good thing. Um, but skepticism when paired with, you know, the massive amounts of misinformation online can be a, a troubling combo that leads to more distrust than we would hope to see in scenarios where the government is actually trying to help people, for example, in the wake of a natural disaster or encouraging them to vaccinate so that they're protected from deadly diseases. Right. So um, can you discuss any differences that you've seen um, regarding uh, hesitancy or approaches to public health um, in rural versus urban areas in America? How does this play out? 
Yeah, I mean, I think that's a really great question. And it's one that I find fascinating. I, I do a lot of work on rural health topics. And I think it's an understudied area of research, right? We have to recognize that more than 40 million Americans live in rural communities. And consistent research, overwhelming research demonstrates that rural Americans, they're older, they're sicker, and they have less access to health care than Americans living in urban communities. Um, this is, in fact, something that's covered pretty extensively in my new edited book volume, Rural Healthy People 2030. Um, and when we're thinking about the differences we see in public communities, I think the first place you need to look is healthcare access, right? Um, since 2010, over 140 rural hospitals have closed in the United States. Um, and in other rural hospital communities that have stayed open, a lot of those rural hospitals have had to close certain services like maternity care services, creating maternity care deserts. Um, and even in communities that do maintain rural hospitals, quite often you have a shortage of healthcare providers. You know, over 60% of health professional shortage areas are in rural communities. And when we start thinking about specialist care, for example, mental health care, or even specialties like dermatology, finding those specialists can be quite difficult in rural communities. Um, more generally, if you face a medical emergency in a rural community, all of those access issues mean it could be quite a while before you're seen in the context of an emergency. And when you're talking about someone having a stroke or a heart attack, that time is everything. So that's a really big thing for us to think through. And the last thing I would note too is there's a lack of economic opportunities in certain rural communities. Um, and that can have real consequences for health. It can have consequences because we know that socioeconomic status is an upstream predictor of health, right? Uh, and more broadly than that, we know that economic opportunities or, or lack thereof can be tied to deaths of despair, tied to suicide, as well as deaths in the opioid epidemic. So there are a lot of disparities between rural and urban communities um, and addressing them, understanding them is a really important area of, of study and inquiry. Okay. So if we are about halfway through a, uh, a new semester, um, uh, lots of new students coming in wanting to pursue um, careers in public health. What advice would you give these new students? Yeah, I mean, I think there's a lot of pieces of advice I'd want to give to new students, but if I had to summarize it, it's, it would actually be a pretty common quote, right? Be the change you want to see in the world around you. Um, and that comes across in a lot of ways. One, vote, right? We're about to enter a presidential election. And in that context, participate. Participate and vote for someone who you believe at the local, the state, the federal level is going to be advancing your interests in policy, right? Because policy means everything, especially in the healthcare context. You should also be volunteering for the causes that you believe in uh, and seeking out knowledge, right? We're, we're in the middle of a semester. We're, we're, we work for students, which is wonderful. We want them to seek out knowledge, both in formal contexts, like in our classes, but also in informal ways on the topics that they're really passionate about. Um, and then moving forward, you know, if we're talking to the younger generation, work to try and find a career that both excites you and where you can think you can make a difference in, in ways that matter to you. You know, so it sort of wraps up nicely in that idea of be the change you want to see, but it encompasses a lot of things. It's voting, it's volunteering, it's seeking out knowledge and, you know, building a career that's going to make you excited to go to work every day and proud of what you do. So that's what I would probably say to the younger generation. Yes, uh, public health um, is not a passive sport, right? At no, all. it is not. <laughs> so, Dr. Callahan, I want to thank you so very much for joining us today and sharing your research, sharing your perspectives, um, and being part of the SBH Reads uh, series. Happy to do it. Thanks so much for having me. Thank you.